Knowledge is too wonderful And I can't even understand it Such knowledge is the depths where I could make my bed, but I never went hide and seek, you're so good at finding me, only lost in the mystery of the depth of your love. Your hand will hold me still, even where, even where my world is shaking. Your hand will hold me still. I'm fearfully. We've got uh... good morning. I was just telling Chris that I just have never been 
so grateful when I see people's faces as I have been recently. You know, just to see a person's face just makes me so full of gratitude, so full of joy. So it really is a pleasure uh, to be in the house with you. We totally understand if you're not able to be here today, especially if you've been around folks who've been ill, you're right where you need to be if you're online. If you're with us for the first time, we want you to know that you are welcome to into this into this worship experience. It would help us a lot to know that you're here. Text Mosaic Church to 31996 to let us know that you're here. Anybody can text that number to share your prayer requests with us, and we love hearing how we can pray for you or praise God together with you. Uh, if you text Mosaic Church to 31996, it'll take you to a place where you can share your prayer request. You can also let us know if your information has changed so we can be in touch with you, and you can also tell us how we can best connect you with the group because that's what's most important to us is keeping everybody connected especially in this season and connection has been sort of cool lately i gotta tell you guys we've got two people from mcdonough with us at this service we have four people at the first service from the atlanta area and the coolest part was that they are part of Didi's Dee group and they are participating in the Maxwell House Stuff a Socks pro project. And they brought 61 pairs of stuffed socks. Isn't that great? So it's just such a pleasure to see the ripples and to see how our online community is growing and feeling connected. So we just want you to know, you're welcome in this place. You bring us joy, you bring me joy. I want you to stand up and let's sing some joy.
nature see and heaven and nature see let heaven and heaven and nature see amen amen Mackenzie would you bring up verse 3 as I was singing this it just made me think about this accursed pandemic and just thinking that the grace of God, the goodness of God is hitting every part, every place where the curse is found, it is being overcome by the grace of God. So let's just sing this from that place. No more let sin and sorrow grow. No more let sin and sorrow grow. Nor thorns and fair the ground he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found far as the curse is found far as far as the curse is Yes, you do, Lord. Yes, you do. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you. I worship you. Turning lives around 
feel that you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working never stop you never stop working never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop you are way making miracle work promise keep the light in the darkness bless your name we bless your name and Jesus we it is our joy and it is our honor for you to be Lord and Jesus we invite you to we invite you to mess up our service we just invite you to do whatever you want to do in this house right now do it do it. Jesus. Brothers and sisters, just close your eyes and behold his glory. Behold the glory of the living one. I have died. And yet, look, I am alive. Jesus, you are the risen one. You are the risen one, King Jesus. Yes. Yes.
feel the experience of being in the tent of meeting with G with the Holy Spirit with the Father however that feels for you whether it's on your knees or uh, just making your chair into an altar or however that works for you just to have the experience it's just you and the tent of meeting like Moses with the Father and there was a time when the Israelite uh, people were just extremely disobedient and God had had it with them. He told Moses, you, you guys go on without me. I'm afraid if I go with you, I'll, I'll crush these people. And Moses, right there in the tent of meeting, just Moses and the Spirit of the Lord, just them. Moses said, you've been telling me lead these people, but you haven't let me know whom you'll send with me. You've said I know you by name and you found favor with me. Lord, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I can know you and continue to find favor with you. Lord, I want you to remember this nation, they're your people. They're your people. And the Lord, the Lord heard the heart of this man for people. And the Lord said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And that's the word I want to ask you to hear over your life over your circumstances. That God's presence is a promise. If we show up, He will. My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. Can you hear that as God's word over your life? My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. That promise ought to provoke in us confession. Here's, here's the thing. God is present. We aren't always present. And there's that, there's that verse in the song we've just been singing. I'm sorry, when I've just gone through the motions. I wonder if you can just, I wonder if you can just make that song, that verse, that verse into your prayer. So we consider that God's promise is to be here and, and our confession is we've not always responded in kind. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry God. 
When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Today is the first day of the Christian New Year The Christian Year The first day of the Christian Year Today will be a great day Say, Lord, I am sorry for going through the motions this year Take me back to where we started Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anybody know you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will do that thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then then Moses prayed that glorious prayer Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory, Lord. And God passed by Moses and he said, I am the Lord, gracious, full of mercy, steadfast love, slow to anger. face of that God we're humbled we're sorry God we're sorry for going through the motions and we're sorry for multitasking our way through worship and we're sorry God for dialing it in way too often dialing it in we're sorry God for having gotten off track and we're praying Jesus that you get us back get us back to that place where we want nothing but you nothing but you I just want yeah. you. Yeah. Nothing else. Nothing else, Jesus. And nothing else. Nothing else will do. Make this your prayer. I just want you. my prayer for us is that your presence would go with us into this time of worship we would we would sense ourselves in this in this tent in this holy tent totally present to you as you are totally present to us and lord we do ask we do ask that you would show us your glory make us worthy god we want to experience your glory god We want to know your presence. Jesus, we want to know your presence. To be present to you as you were present to us. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. We love, honor, and worship you. We love, honor, and worship you. Sing this one more time. I want nothing but you. Just want nothing but you. Yeah, Jesus. Jesus. And nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, 
Word says, Moses said, if I found favor in your eyes, then go with us. That's our prayer, God. If we found favor, go with us. We love, honor, and worship you, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. Oh, what a glorious, glorious opportunity just to worship, just to be in his presence as he is in our presence. He's here. He's here. What a glorious thing. Hmm. So if you are worshiping with us for the first time, it really is a privilege. We're just grateful. Please receive his service as our gift to you. If uh, you're part of the family of faith, the body of Christ, then we appreciate your being with us as members or as partners in ministry. Um, if you're online with us, you can give by texting GIVEMO, G-I-V-E-M-O, to 73256. If you text uh, that message to that number, then it will take you through a process that will allow you to give. You can also give by going to our website, mosaicchurchevans.org. Click on the Give tab, and it will take you through the same process. If you're here in person, you can give online, or you can give through one of these little boxes that are by the exit as you leave. It means the world to us who are, uh, who are doing this vocationally that you continue to support the ministry so that we can continue to reach people beyond the walls and uh, so thank you even more thank you for making giving part of your worship life it's what we've been instructed to do since the days of of genesis and so thank you for making giving part of your worship thank you so we're gonna be in luke chapter one today you can find it if you need to uh go ahead and do that but we'll take a minute to get there as usual um you need a Bible, something to write with, and something to write on so that you can engage the message fully. And we are now in Advent. Today starts that whole season, which really is the beginning of the Christian year. So today is day one of an opportunity to start over again. And it's a year, it's a day I have been waiting to get to since last year. Um, we did a pre Christmas message about a month ago. As a way of wrapping our heads around the fact that Christmas is coming. <laughs> we can't stop it. <laughs> I told you in that message that I pr planned this year's Christmas message last year on Christmas Day. It happened because of an email I got, which came at the end of what felt to me like a particularly stressful Christmas season, and that was before we even knew what stress was. Last year, we were already struggling. I don't know why, but it just seemed like there were more people, at least in my world, who were experiencing even more tension, even more stress. It's like, you know, we love Christmas, but we don't much like Christmas. We put up with it, but we'd rather not. Almost like that cousin at your, you know, holiday gathering that you love, but you don't really, you know, like. That's been Christmas for a lot of Christians. And I suspect we let ourselves go down that road because we haven't consciously thought through the memory that this holy day is for us. It's ours. It belongs to us. We get to decide how to live this. So on Christmas Day last year, I got an email from someone in our community who actually had remembered this, that Christmas belongs to us and comes with the responsibility to live it faithfully. And here's what she wrote. She wrote, I hope you're all having an incredible Christmas Day. Today my family and I are discussing the possibility of creating our own Christmas tradition. For as long as I can remember, this time of year has been a source of anxiety, sorrow, guilt, and the longing for it to be something more, something else, something joyful. So I have raged against it in my spirit, dug my heels in against it, and I have found every excuse to avoid caring at Christmas, but I will no longer be angry at the season for the joy I failed to find for myself. Christmas does not owe me anything. Today, it finally occurred to me that Christmas can be for us whatever we choose it to be. Old things have passed away. I have to let them die. And out of the ashes will be born a new thing, a God-honoring thing, a loving expression of the gift that is Jesus, a loving expression of all that redemption is in all its beauty and glory for Jesus. That is... One line from that email, Christmas doesn't owe me anything. That 
resonated with me. That got me. It was a feeling I had been sort of trying to process all season last year, feeling like, wait a minute, we're the ones this holiday is for, so why does it come to so many of us as a stressor? And, and, and is that how we want to honor our Emmanuel? Do we, the ones this holiday is for, want to be the ones who are complaining most about what it's become? Or do we want to honor our Emmanuel differently? Of course, last Christmas we had no idea we'd be here this year. If we thought last Christmas was stressful, well, we'd give anything to have last Christmas back, amen? <laughs> so this is gonna be a very different Christmas season. And we've got questions swirling again about gatherings, even family gatherings. And so given all that, what do we owe the world? What is manageable for us, for people who are already stretched, you know, emotionally and likely financially, do we attempt all our usual stuff? Or do we consider and get intentional about what will be best for our own mental and emotional and especially our own spiritual health? What would be best for us as well as f for our families and for our community, for this community? Those are the questions I'm praying through as your pastor. I'm thinking, what would be best for us I want you to be able to live through this Christmas, not just safely, but I actually want you to, to thrive through this season spiritually. So what I want to propose is that we spend this month walking through the Christmas story as it's told in Luke, both here on Sunday mornings and you're getting a devotional starting today, every day in your inbox if, you're, if, if we have your information. And if you're not getting one and you think we have your information, please let us know because we want to clean that up if, we've, if you're not getting it. Um, and we're gonna keep these questions in mind both with the daily devotional and with the Sunday messages. We'll ask ourselves, what do I owe to this community during Christmas and what do I owe my family? What do I owe myself? And most importantly, what do I owe Jesus? Today we're asking that first question, what do I owe my community? And I'm thinking both about this community but also our larger community. I have a thought about it but before we get there, I want you to get into the story. Luke chapter 1, let's begin with verse 5. Just the first two verses, 5 and 6. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So this couple, both of them, were from the line of Aaron, the priestly line. To have two people in the same household, both from that lineage, was something like spiritual royalty. It was a big deal. It set them apart. And the story says they were both righteous, which sets them even further apart. You and I both know there's a difference between a priest and a righteous priest. Amen? <laughs> Elizabeth and Zechariah took their call to the priesthood seriously. They quietly, faithfully followed God out of pure and obedient hearts. And, and in fact, that's, that's the first kind of principle I get from their story. It is that God honors faithful hearts. God honors faithful people. God uses faithful people. You should write that down. God uses faithful people. Write that down. And Zechariah and Elizabeth's child, John, would take faithfulness to a whole other level. You know, I've often wondered if John the Baptist actually knew. I mean, can you imagine? You know, you're going through, you're kind of living out your life faithfully. You have no idea that the whole world will be talking about you 2,000 years later. Did John have any idea that he was fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy that that, that he would prepare the way for the coming Lord? Or was he just a guy who wore sackcloth, lived in the woods, ate buds, bugs, because that's what he does for a living? I mean, that's the way he does life. Um, did he know he was prophesying when he called people to repentance? Did he know he was preparing the way for Jesus? Or was he just doing what he knew how to do because it was all he knew? He was so deeply entrenched and immersed in his call that he had a bad case of what my mama called can't help it. You know, the case, of the, I, can't, I don't know what else to do but this. Are all these people, Zechariah and Elizabeth and John, really that bright? Or were they just faithfully doing what they knew to do with no real idea of where it would lead? 
that witness teaches me, actually, that maybe my job is figuring out, is not, not, <laughs> Carolyn, don't do that Freudian sli slip thing, not trying to figure out the line between A and B, but just do the thing I know I'm supposed to do. Amen. You know, yes. it comes from the deepest place in me. Yes. In the last few weeks, every sermon, it seems like I have had, there's been like one line that I preach to myself. And I don't see it when I write the message. I see it later. And that line that I just shared with you, that's the one that sat back in my chair and was like, oh my goodness, that's for me. Just do the thing I know I'm supposed to do. Just do the thing I know I'm supposed to do. I mean, somewhere deep inside me, there is a very, very joyful person who just wants to love the crazy out of people. <laughs> not y'all. Y'all not crazy. But you know, the ones we know that we're all trying to reach. And, and just, just, just wants to preach the pain off the walls and wants, to, and wants people to know Jesus. But I get in front of people and something else shows up. And I just heard the Lord say, no, nah, just do the thing you know you're supposed to do. Yeah. Just do the thing that is so deep in you that you can't help it. Wouldn't that be a great way to live the season? Just do the thing that is deep inside you. And, and learn the voice of God. Yes. Because you don't want to do the thing that the crazy voice inside you is telling you to do. You want to do the thing that the Holy Spirit's voice is telling you to do. So learn the voice of God. Really learn it. That was, I mean, that's a huge lesson from the life of Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John. Learn the voice of God and seek faith, more faith. Lord, give me more faith, please, because my faith is such a remarkable gift from the Lord. It is my connection back to the Father. It is my lifeline and my treasure and the cord that channels the Spirit's power. My faith is the channel. Last, last week, I gave you a breath prayer, just a one-line short prayer. It was infuse me, Holy Spirit, with joy. I want to give you a different breath prayer this week. One line, infuse me, Father, with faith. Write that down. Make that your prayer this season. Say it every day this month, and especially on the days when you don't know how it's all going to turn out. Infuse me, Father, with faith. And I want you to listen, there's something else in this story too that's just powerful. It gets my attention because it reminds us just how intimately involved with faithful hearts God can be. It's in their names. Zechariah literally means Jehovah or God remembers. And Elizabeth's name literally means oath of God. So when Zechariah and Elizabeth married each other and came together, they literally became Jehovah remembers his oath or God remembers his promises. How awesome is that? So this couple is sort of a walking prophecy for Israel because Israel was desperately watching and waiting for God's promised Messiah. But for over 400 years, there had been no uh, memorable, written, prophetic voice for them. 400 years, after a while, that begins to feel like rejection. Like, like they'd been forgotten, like maybe God had changed his mind on them, or like maybe he'd gone back on his promise. But here in this couple, God makes a statement for those who are spiritually sensitive enough to hear it, to pick up on it. He announces that he has not forgotten. He has not rejected his people. God keeps his promises. That is so fundamental, and you need to write it down because somewhere way back there, God spoke a promise into your life. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on you. That's an eternal word. If you feel like God has forgotten you or has forgotten us or has changed his mind about hum uh, humanity, you need to go back to Jeremiah 29, 11. This is a word from God spoken over the people of Israel after they've been sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It would be like somebody evicting you from your house and sending you to, I don't know, New Jersey. <laughs> Not the place you want to go. Unless, of course, you're in person who loves New Jersey. Don't take it personal. I'm just saying. Um, for us in the South, that would be pretty rough. And he tells them, make the best of it. 
Because even though it might not be the best situation, God will be with them, and eventually he will get them back to Jerusalem. That's what God says in Jeremiah. He won't forget them. And he tells them, Jeremiah 29, 11, he's, remember, he's talking to Israelites in exile in Babylon. He tells them, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future with hope. We want to grab that one verse, take it out of context, and paste it into every whim and hope we have. But that was God's word for the Israelites. It served a specific purpose in keeping them encouraged during their exile. But it does teach us something. God's word for the Israelites teaches us that God does work from a plan. That was God's word for them, but it is an eternal word. It, it is God's word for us too. God works from a plan. He didn't just create you and then wonder what you're good for. If there was no plan for your life, you would not exist. He's not going to abandon you now. So here's the promise. From the moment God dreamed you, God has had a plan for you, a preferred future. You may not have chosen to live that preferred future, but God has had a preferred future in mind for you. And this word extends to all God's people. In fact, it begins there. He has plans for us, and nothing can separate us from that. Romans 8, Paul in Romans 8 tells us God is for us, and nothing else in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God that dreamed us up and placed into us a purpose. You may be saying, well, that's all well and good, but everything I was hoping for was shot to smithereens in 2020. So what about my crush dreams? I don't know where this is headed or what my life is going to be like on the other side of it. I had a minute, I saw this just this weekend, a ministry leader, a nationally known ministry leader posted just this one sentence he said, I don't know if so much of what we're seeing among clergy right now is burnout or just people who have lost their will for ministry. Kind of broke my heart because I could feel it. Have we just lost our will for something? Whatever it is your call is, I want you to hear. You might have lost it for a minute, but God hasn't. You know that John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for his friends. And he prays for the ones who were with him when he walked the earth. But then, I want you to hear this, he prays for the rest of us. He says, I don't want to pray only for my friends. I pray also for all those who will believe in me through this message. And Jesus goes on to say that what he's praying for is that anyone who believes will be brought to completeness. That's incredible. That's sort of an astonishing thought to me, that Jesus is praying for any who believe in him, but he's not just praying that you'll believe in him and get out of hell. He's praying that you will be brought to completeness, that you will find wholeness in this life. Amen. He's praying that we will be in perfect union with God and his plan in this life. Romans 8 says basically the same thing, that the Holy Spirit prays for us even when we don't know how to pray. Amen. So take all that together, what Jeremiah and John and Paul and Jesus have all said, and it adds up to this one amazing promise that God, with all he has, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is for us. He has created us with a purpose in mind. He has a plan for us. He has not forgotten that or given up on us. Jesus is still praying for you right now. And he's not just praying that you won't get sick. He's got much bigger plans than that for you. He is praying that you will experience his glory. Yes. He is praying that you will find completeness. Yes. All of that is to say that Jesus is for us. He is here. He is present. 
So what can you do for your community this month, this community, your faith community? I would say be present in faith. Be present. Now, I realize that right now it's not safe for everyone to be present in the house. So I want to say a word to you guys who are online. I want you guys to listen in. You can be present in worship this month. I have to tell you, as your pastor, it really matters to me that at some point in the week, you set everything aside so you can worship the living God. And that may mean for you that the liturgy you prepare before you sit down to worship is about 10 minutes before worship, I'm going to go to the bathroom, I'm going to get my coffee, I'm going to put, put away everything that might distract me, and I am going to be present to my community in the way that I can be present. That's the online liturgy. <laughs> I think we all need to be challenged not to multitask our way through worship. That's what Elizabeth and Zachariah discovered. You know, they were kind of distracted themselves. Up to this point in the story, they'd not been able to have kids. They're in their 60s. They're childless. Looks for all the world like God has forgotten them. But he hasn't. He's with them. He intends to work out his plans through them. Look at verse 8 and 9. Luke 1, 8 and 9. Once when Elizabeth, excuse me, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now there were a thousand priests serving in the temple in Jerusalem. I mean thousands, not, not a thousand, thousands of priests serving the temple. The chances of getting chosen to go into the holy place to burn incense were pretty slim. But on this day, by lot, Zechariah was chosen. And while he was in there, verses 11 and 12, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear, which cracks me up. It's an unnerving thing to go into the holy place, I bet. You only did it once. To make it even more intimidating, when a priest went into the holy place, to the holy of holies, the other, somebody else would tie a rope to their ankles so that if they died while they were in there, they could pull them out. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the whole experience was pretty intimidating, but still, it strikes me as sort of ironic that Isaiah, I mean, sorry, that Zechariah, knowing where he was going, was still spooked by an angel when he got in there, almost like, he was surprised to find something spiritual in the holy place. Which makes me ask myself, how often do I come into the place of worship? That's what I'm talking about, people. How often do I come into the place of worship, whether it's online or in person, without expecting to find anything spiritual in there? Do you come into this place of worship expectant? Are you fully present? Imagine what would happen if we all came expecting God to show up. It's one of the hidden blessings of COVID since we've begun meeting in person again. The spirit in this room, I got to tell you, it's been really special, hasn't it? There is something, very few people, but a really big spirit. Folks who show up tend to show up believing God is here. And you guys are fully present, and I want to thank you for that. And that's a gift we want to build on as the pandemic eases out and the rest of us show up. We want that kind of sweet, worshipful spirit in this place, fully present. Listen to the conversation between Zechariah and the angel Gabriel, the angel of the Lord. I'm going to start in verse 13, and I'm going to skip some a, l a little bit. We'll end in verse 18, so just listen. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're to give him the name John. I want you to remember this, that John means God is gracious. That's important. 
He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my, wo- my wife is well along in years, which is not the right answer, clearly. <laughs> Zechariah, um, excuse me, uh, Gabriel is not amused. I don't think Gabriel has much of a sense of humor. I don't know if all angels are like that, but Gabriel does not have a sense of humor. Gabriel is like, you're asking an angel how a miracle is possible. Okay. And we have to wonder, too, about Zechariah, if there was some bitterness in what he was saying, maybe. You know, I'm already old and you're coming here. My wife is already up in years, and now, now you're doing this? Maybe he felt like God had given up on him. We know he wasn't just honestly trying to understand because of the way the angel responded. Evidently for Gabriel, this was like giving someone a gift and then having them give it back. And we, as we say at Mosaic all the time, when God gives you a gift, take it. So the angel was a little miffed when I, and Zechariah didn't seem excited. And he tells him so. Verse 19, look at verse 19. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. It's sort of like, are you serious? I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, (laughs) and I have been sent down here to this God-forsaken place, which is not God-forsaken, but I sure want to say it's God-forsaken right now because it looks it, to speak to you and to tell you this good news, and now you're going to be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. I just got to love that. How does Gabriel know Because God keeps his promises. So by striking him unable to speak, Gabriel has just given Zechariah the equivalent of about nine months to contemplate the nature of God. (laughs) God in his wisdom and goodness wants Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, the one who will announce the coming of the Messiah, to know that he knows that God is good, that God is for us, that God keeps his promises, that God wants not just this man's obedience. He wants his heart. Same chapter, a few verses later, Gabriel, the same angel, comes to Mary. Verse 20. uh, 20, uh, 36, excuse me, 36, and, and he responds, she responds a lot like Zachariah, how can this be since I'm a virgin, Mar- Mary says. The difference between her question and Zachariah's question is that she is a 14-year-old girl and he was a 60-year-old priest. She doesn't really know how it happens with angels. So Gabriel explains to her, verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren barren, is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary takes that at face value, and she says, well, then let it happen the way God wants it to happen. I mean, she's basically just reached back and grabbed hold of Jeremiah 29, And has said, okay, this is a God who does not want to hurt me, who has plans for me to give me a future and a hope. I wonder what choice in your life needs that kind of response. Where do you need to lean in in faith? Instead of arguing, where do you need to trust God? John Piper says this. It is possible to demand too much evidence before you accept God's promises. <laughs> you need to write that down. It is possible to demand too much evidence before you accept God's promises. He's not talking about being foolish. He's talking about the reasonable expectation that an all-powerful God can and will do the humanly impossible in our lives. Do you believe that with God nothing is impossible? Do you believe that if you show up, he will? In fact, I want you to write that in first person. If I show up, God will. I want you to write that in first person, put it on a post-it note, and put it on your bathroom mirror. If I show up, 
God will. Look at verse 23. When his time of service was completed, Zechariah returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. This is Elizabeth talking. This is Elizabeth who, by her husband's way of putting it, is not a spring chicken herself. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Underline that word, disgrace. That is a powerful principle. Their, their whole story is, is happens like it happens. So Elizabeth will get this point that God heals disgrace. Do you remember the name the angel said to give to, to the baby she was to have? His name is John, and do you remember what it means? God is gracious, exactly. God gives grace, and he heals in us all those moments we lived without grace, outside the purposes of God. God heals in us all those moments we lived in shame, unable to feel the grace, the love, the care, the provision of God. Everything that happened to Elizabeth and Zechariah happened so God's Messiah could bring into the world the great news that God heals disgrace. I love the way Chanda Pierce talks about this when she talks about the creation story. And you guys have heard me talk, talk, tell this one before, but you're going to hear it again because it's so good. Chanda talks about how in the story of Adam and Eve, before they sinned or ever talked to that serpent, the Bible says they were naked and unashamed. There was no sense of judgment, no sense of condemnation, no sense of feeling un, in an unholy exposure no fear of rejection, and then the temptation of Satan to be something that they were not, and then that terrible fall from grace, and that's when a first human first saw himself or herself as somehow not good enough. That's why they put clothes on, just trying to hide behind something, trying to compensate or overcompensate. It must have broken the father's heart to see his beautiful children experience such shame, disgrace. So God came looking for them. And since they were covered, he asked, where are you? And they answered, we were afraid because we were naked. And so we hid ourselves. And God said, and you can just hear the grief in his voice, who told you you were naked? Who told you you had something to be ashamed of? Who told you? Who spoke that word into your life? Because that word is a lie. And that word is the very word that our Jesus has come to heal. He came to heal that word of disgrace, that lie. Someone along the way has spoken into our lives to make us feel sh ashamed. That lie that because you are childish, you are somehow a second-class citizen. Or that lie that because you are broke, you are worthless. Or that lie that because you have a past, then you no longer have a future. That lie that makes us overfunction and overcompensate when all that is being asked of us is that we simply show up in faith. Yeah. Amen. Simply be present to the plans of God, believing in the promise that if I show up, He will. Yeah. To simply be, which is enough. We have had nine months now to learn how to simply be. Sort of, sort of the, the equivalent of Zachariah's be mute. I was like, be alone a little bit and learn how to be. And if you haven't gotten it yet, today is the first day of the Christian year and you can decide in this season to start again. And to learn how to be. 
Zechariah had the humbling privilege of learning how to simply be as he sat in silence for nine months to contemplate God's purposes for the world and his life and the word that opened his mouth and gave him back his voice was the name of his son when his child was born and Zechariah and Elizabeth God remembers his promises directed the people to name their son John God is gracious. Zechariah got his voice back. And that word, grace, will give you your voice too. It's the word that allows us to live trusting that it is God's work, not ours. I want you to write that down. It is God's work, not ours. So this season, direction of the world, the unanswered questions, all the stuff, for the faithful person, all of it is conquered by this truth. It is God's work, right. not ours. And we are most present to the world, to our community, to our family, to ourselves, to Jesus, when we are present in that truth. It is God's work, not mine. If I show up, he will. He's good for his promises. He's not giving up on me. I want to ask you to stand. And I want you to hear the word of the Lord. God is gracious. Which means that I don't have to control everything. Come on. I can just be present. I don't have to have all the answers. I can just be present. I love Taylor Williams' question in her devotional, that the one that she wrote for us today. How will you be present to what God is doing this season? How will you be present to what God is doing this season? Lord Jesus, I am so sorry I am so sorry it has taken me so far into this pandemic to get it. And all you really need for me to do is to be present in the way you have made me to be present. Just do the thing you made me to do. Just do the thing you made me to do. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the times when I've just gone through the motions. Sorry for kind of setting it all aside and thinking we'll just power through this and then we'll start back the way things were. Sorry that I have not seen how you can make even this work together for good because I love you. So I speak over my friends even while I pray over myself. God knows the plans he has for you because he made you. And in this exile that we are in, he does not intend to harm you. We live in a fallen world, and a disease is wreaking havoc on a lot of people, and we don't deny that or downplay that. We just know what's true, that above the fallen world in the kingdom of God, he has plans for us. And even in a pandemic, he can live out those plans in us. There are plans to give us a future and hope. So, Lord, I pray that you would give it to us to grab hold of those plans and to be present to you as you're present to us. God with us. God with us. Emmanuel. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Israel that mourns a lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Oh, God.
verses that talks about bringing us back into unity and um, in a world that is crazy divided right now and with so much distance between us it seems really important that we do the things we can do to uh, to bring unity and to encourage each other one way you can be present to your community this season is by fully engaging in the online devotionals I believe there's something real that happens spiritually when we read the same passages, pray the same prayers together. So I want to invite you every day this season to open that devotional, read the passage, uh, and, and definitely pray the prayer at the end together. And let's use that to draw our community together, to be present to each other in all the ways that we possibly can. And let the Lord speak. Um, let the Lord encourage your spirit. Go in peace. May the peace of God go with you.